excuse my platform, by the way. Mm -hmm. um, I've been a follower of your work for a very long time. I pattern, my, I've said this many times on my platform, I pattern uh, my style of media behind you and Arliss Michaels. When I started, there was only a couple of people who you know I could use as a prototype and say, okay, this is how you do this. I'm gonna need a, ch I'm gonna need a chapter. I'm gonna need to break these into chapters. I'm gonna need a menu. I'm gonna need a, um, a, 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 a still picture for the menu. And I did all of that watching you, so I appreciate your contributions to urban media. Yes, sir. How you feel about what you created? Um, Cause it's huge now. Is <laughs> the gangster thing? Yeah. It's you talking about the industry as general? Like you general you, just... you the forefather. You the first nigga to put it on camera. Yeah. yeah. To my knowledge. Yeah. Yeah. And when you go online now and you see um, just all these different people and all these gangster stories now, when as it might have only been a dozen mm -hmm. when it was in your hands, mm -hmm. now it's thousands. Yeah. How you feel about how it just spun out of control? I mean, you know, actually, when I started, there was no gangster stories. You know what I'm saying? There was, uh, there was, the urban market, what was considered as the urban market was men's society and boys in the hood. That was what was considered our urban market. And when I went to corporate America, um, they could not understand, you know, they, they had no idea what I was telling them about the street guys and street characters. You know what I'm saying? Right. So so when I started, like, I didn't even know the name to choose for this. And it and so happened. I just happened to be talking. And I was like, you know, I'm, I'm trying to highlight these. I was telling this girl named Jackie. I was like, I'm trying to highlight these guys that was in the streets, but they're not in the streets no more. And I said, it's like they they street stars. Right. And I was just telling her that. Yeah. And she was like, that's the name. Right there, Street Stars. Okay. And that's how I actually came up with the name because there was nothing in front of me. The only thing I ever saw at that time was on Channel 13, PBS right. was like highlighting the Mafia right. and Al Capone. And right. that's what you saw back then. Um, the History Channel never highlighted no gangland, no nothing at that time. Right. No, the most you might have saw is a documentary if, and I don't even think so, was Noriega. Okay. About Noriega, but that was more about the president and the country yeah. and him selling drugs. You know what right. I'm saying? So, you know, me doing what I'm doing was really, like, hard trying to convince corporate America about these street stars and these street legends. But along the way, at the same time, a market emerged. And that market started emerging from, like, Feds Magazine. You know what I'm saying? Because they, they laid it down and did what they did with the magazine. And you had Don Diva and Carvario and Tiffany... And them doing what they doing, and at the same time, you know, it was me with the visual of, of like, street, the, the, the real people. You know what I'm saying? Right. And at that time, believe it or not, there was nobody to even go get as my first street star. The only person that was still on the street was AZ. And my man Prince introduced me to AZ, and that's how I was able to get somebody visually. Okay. You know what I'm saying? To be on the documentary. So, so he was the first... He yeah. was the first person. First and, person. Yeah, he was the first person that I was able... He was the only person on the streets. Okay. Everybody else was doing life, was doing was in jail, or was dead. Right. AZ was like the first person on a level that I could actually find and put together the story on. Right. You know what I'm saying? And, um, you know, when I approached him about it, he was like, you know, let's go. You know what I'm saying? And um, we set out and we started putting it together. There's a whole story behind, you know, us... It was, it was a whole story behind us actually going to do, you know, what would be called the game over. You know what I'm saying? The right. whole process. But that's how I actually, you know, started it. So there was no market. There was no, there was no, over, and then right behind me came a, a DVD called All Access and a, and, a, and, a, and, a, and a couple of other ones. You know what I'm saying? As is. As is. Yeah. Um, um, uh, Smack DVD. Um, to come up with Frenchie, French Montana, all of them. You know, everybody was, it was a whole movement. And that movement was so strong that I eventually went to Warner Brothers like years later, probably three, four years later out into that movement right. that was so strong. And when I went to Warner Brothers, it was so much content from so many people doing their thing across the country, city to city, state to state. I took a suitcase with me, my, one of my... Last meetings with one, I had three meetings with them. The first one, they turned me down. The second one, they was interested, but they was trying to offer me 80-20. And I told them, I, I got 800 stores across the country. 
and I'm doing numbers with it. Mom and pop joints. Mom and pops that I that that I'm doing numbers with. Right. I'm making more money doing my own thing. And I said, um, only way I'll do this deal is if you give me an 80 20. I take 80, y'all take 20. And um, my last meeting when I came back to show them what I was talking about, I bought a big suitcase, like the African suitcases, mm -hmm. right? And I had Feds magazines, I had Dawn Divas, I had every street magazine, I had every street DVD in that suitcase. And when I pulled it on the table in that meeting, they was like, I said, all these people are doing hundreds of thousands of dollars a month. Yeah. This is what y'all missing out on. Yeah. And they didn't understand that and they was blown away. And from that meeting right there is where they was like, you know what? We'll do an 80-20. We'll give you 80 and we'll take 20 and we want to become a part of that distribution Because of the system. shit that you put on that table that day. Because of what I put on that table that day and I showed them. And we used to go hard. You know, I could see, it was so much, it was love back there between, amongst us. Where I would see like Smack DVD, Kid Troy. I would see him in Miami at the Source Awards and he might have, he might have bought 50 or 100 DVDs with him, but he didn't really want to sell them hand to hand. Right. I would be like, yo, let me get those. Go to his room, yo, let me get that for you. I'd be in the middle of the aisles at the Source Awards in Miami selling DVDs, Booming. making like twenty thousand, and <laughs> selling selling his twenty thousand just from that one trip. You know what I'm saying? With two vans full of DVDs, selling them to Suge Knight, selling them to the Houston Boys, selling them to the BMF. You know, it was everybody was there was love, right? And that's how we sold DVDs and 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 building stores. So if I if I meet you out of town and you live in Detroit, or you live somewhere, and you're like, yo, I got a store. I'm like, no doubt here. This is this this is this is my number. Call me. I send you 100 DVDs and cash me out. Yeah, Let's the information go. was on the DVD. Yeah. yeah. So that's how the market started. So it's um, you know, it was a rough, rigorous but fun road. Right. You know to go to. Why did the Alpo Martinez project seem to morph into a into, into such a personal relationship? Well. First things first, I would have to say is, I got a credit to my man Pop from Blackstar, because Pop and his brother Stu, they was the ears to the street. Blackstar knew what was going on in every city, every place across the country. They knew because they had everybody. They was distributing and helped building the same Blackstar template. Right. They was building that in every city and every state because everybody had to come to them to get it. So Pop was like, yo, Troy, listen. I know you did the game over and that's cool, but I'm getting all these calls from around the country about the character Alpo. People want something on Alpo. They, they want you to do something on just him. Like, it was a big fascination about him. You know what I'm saying? Right. So, I, I listened because that's my, he's my eyes and ears. You know right. what I'm saying? So, I jumped right into it and I got in contact with a kid and uh that was going to see him named Oli and uh made it happen. Right. You know what I'm saying? And and that's where um, you know, that's where that fascination comes. So Alpo's the buzz that he had, he had back then. Yeah. People was fascinated back then with him, uh just from the movie Paid in Full and just from what people heard about him just standing on his own. They love AZ Alpo Rich Porter, but it was something about Alpo. Right. You know what I'm saying? Growing up in the South Bronx was like, it was fun. You know what I'm saying? It was real fun. Um, you know, one of the, one of the, you know, where I lived at in the South Bronx, I lived in this building called 308 in Patterson Projects. And right in front of my building is a park called 18 Park. And that park is where Guy Fisher had his motorcycle garage at. And that's where Nicky Barnes would come to see him. So when I was around like five or six years old, my my mother and father used to tell me if I ever catch you on that end of the park, because the park is mad big and there was basketball courts and swings on that side where they would be. Right. And my mother, um, mainly my pops would tell me, listen, if I catch you on that side of the park, I'm gonna bust you upside your head. And that side of the park was forbidden to go to. But as five and six, I used to observe all these important men going over to that side of the park, driving through there. All these motorcycles, real expensive cars. And, and I remember this vividly. And it was crazy because that stayed in my mind as I was getting older, as I got older, that like I saw all this glam. I didn't know who the guys was. I didn't know who the men was. But I just knew that was a really important place over there. 
and don't go over there. Right. And that's what kind of helped me come up with Street Stars. And um, so the seed was planted as youth. She was already there. Okay. She was already there because she never could take your eyes off them hustlers. Oh, you, it was anybody that knows 18 Park. Just say 18 Park. That's where the Casanovas would be at. That's where the Black Spades. That's where all the gangs. That's where the jams would be. Grandmaster Flash. Some of the top jams in the South Bronx was in 18 Park with Grandmaster Flash. Right. So this park is real known. So, but in this park was all of, was like I said, Guy Fisher and Nicky Barnes and them used to be back there. So one of the things that happened was when I got a little older, I was playing basketball and I left that path and I came back from North Carolina and started, um, you know, uh, 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 hustling a little bit, trying to get in the streets a little bit. And around like 17, you know, when I was selling crack and stuff, a couple of crackheads used to call me stick. So I used to say like, who's stick? I used to always wonder like, who's stick? And then one day the this, this dude, he wanted to get high, so he said, give me two or three bottles and I'll tell you who Stick is. So I gave him the bottles and he started telling me Stick was Guy Fisher. So from that point on, I was fascinated with this character, Guy Fisher. Never knew him, but I know he's from my project now. Okay. And they called him Stick, but his name was Guy. And um, at, once I started getting a little money, I ran with the name, Guy Fisher. I was, that was my name. I'm going to be Guy and stuff. Because um, people say they, I remind them of him. And... Um, from that point on right there, that was like my street role model, my street idol Got was Guy Fisher, just from the stories that I heard about him. And all the people that was from his era, a lot of people from his era was getting high on coke, heroin, drugs. So I always had drugs. I started creating this little pattern with them where I'd be like, tell me, tell me some stories about back in the days and I'll get you high. Right. So I would sit on the car at like 4 or 5 o'clock in the morning just listening to stories from them and, and, and giving them drugs and they tell me stories. And that's how Street Stars came about. Right. Because I grew up and I was hustling, just listening to all these fascinating stories. So the day that I stopped hustling when I was around 24, 25, I was looking for something to do. And I was like, man, what if I did like a magazine or my own show or something highlighting all these stories I know about. Right. And that's when I was explaining it to the girl and once I said Street Star, she was like, that's what you should name it. And that's how I came up with, you know, Street Stars and, you know, I've dabbled in the street, you know, in the streets you got tears. So let's say you got the Connect, it's tier one. Let's say Outpoise and them is tier two. They need a young boy, they got some people, somebody they hitting on consignment. I was that tier three kid. No doubt. You know what I'm saying? I never... You know, I never had it in me to really, I never, I looked at hustling as fun. It was all fun. You know, right. I had barbershops, beauty salons. I've, I've, I've had cars. I've had everything. But I've never, in me personally, said I wanted to go to that next level of hustling. Because I always, I didn't have that eye of the tiger for hustling like that. But people around me did. And they went to that next level. Right. You know what I'm saying? And one of the main things when I was young, I saw my man get killed in front of me. So God bless the dead, my man Reese, and that's one of the things right then and there it made me say, "Oh, I ain't interested in being a gangster. I ain't interested in being a tough guy." And from that point on, is where I realized like I don't want to be a gangster because you got to be a gangster 24 hours a day. And if you ain't built to be that gangster 24 hours a day, you are gonna get exposed. And I watched so many tough guys or so many dudes that wanted to be a gangster get exposed and that's what sent me on the journey to say right, I'm gonna get money and I'm gonna just mess with girls and 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 that led me to that path so that saved me from like going to the feds like everybody around me or doing you know real big jail time and stuff and um once I hit 24 the crack game had changed to two dollar bottles and niggas is now selling crack for two dollars a pack of cigarettes cost more than crack I knew it was time to get out of it and that was one of my first thoughts was street stars. Mm -hmm. Let me do street stars. So that's what made me get into that. You know, that's a little bit of my background. Okay. Um, which, uh, which idea was it that made you passionate enough to go on b and and spend almost $10,000? Um, when I was reading that, I was not I was not expecting that big number at the end yeah. of that sentence, yeah. man. Because I've gotten by with... You, you see, you yeah. know what I'm saying? Yeah. But what what made you go in there and let loose like that? Um, was it a specific 
topic, person that you knew you was going to get a return on the, since you went there like that? Oh, yeah. You you know, you see how you said you could do this for free? Yeah. That's how I was. Actually, I was so fascinated, fascinated that my man, I don't even, you know if you've ever heard of AG and Showbiz. Absolutely. Right? They I from my projects. Speed down. Yeah. Right. They from my projects. And they are also one of the first people that made me be like, yo, that's what I want to do. Once I stopped hustling, I was like, that's what I want to do. I want to make music videos. I want to get into the film business because I never saw a trailer in my neighborhood, a production trailer. Right. I never saw cameras and a crew and a whole set in my neighborhood at that time. So once I saw them shoot a music video in my neighborhood, I was like, yo, that's what I want to do right there. I didn't have a topic. So mm. I went and got some cameras from a place called DCTV that was downtown in Manhattan. They was a non-for-profit that will give you cameras if you want to film in your neighborhood. Public so, access channel. Yes. Yeah. And um, I was I, I tried that. <laughs> yes, and and I didn't know what to film. Yeah, but then I came up with the idea of street stars, and I was like, "Yo, let me get, let me film A Z," and um, I told my man Prince, which was down with them, my man Mark, and Mark he used to be in my barbershop. He was like, "Yo, I could get A Z for you," and he made the connection, and I did my first interview in a similar to this right here, right in my barbershop in the back of my barbershop with A Z. And um, he started talking, and right then and there, I fell in love with what I was doing because I was like, if people could hear what he's telling me, when this come out, when people hear what he's telling me, I'm going to change the world for, yeah. for black cinematography. Yeah. I'm about to change the world. And um, me and AZ wind up documenting him. We wind up becoming like a brotherhood as well. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like me and AZ, we used to live together. You know, we stayed together. And... He really saw my vision because AZ had just finished from writing a movie, Paid in Full, which was really called Trap. Right. And he had just finished doing that. So we was like locked into the same mindset at that time. You know what I'm saying? And um, we had a ball. Like we started filming, you know, he did an article for Feds Magazine and he didn't like the article. So he was like, I want to get on video and, and talk about how they changed my words in Feds Magazine. And I was like, all right, you know, come on, let's do it. That's what you want to do. Let's do it. But as we started filming, he would call me like 2 in the morning and be like, Yo, Troy, I'm going to come to the house, cut the camera on. And he would start talking 2 o'clock in the morning about really deep emotional things. And I was like, yo, forget Feds Magazine. Let's just do your story. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And then we started doing him. But then he was like, yo, I'm going to go get Pat. I'm going to go get Rich's sister. And let's get her to talk. So then we got her. You know what I'm saying? And then we got, you know, then we was like, yo, he wanted to talk about Alpo. So one of the most profound things I'll never forget, he called my answering, answering machine about 3 o'clock in the morning. And on my answer machine, I still have this tape. And he was like, yo, Troy, you want to know when I knew Alpo killed Rich Boy? When he killed Rich? Was when he didn't come to me and be like, yo, where them niggas at? Let's kill them niggas. We're going to murder them niggas. He says, I knew right then and there, Alpo did that. That was like, I was listening to this back in 90-something. That was so profound when he said that to me. So the motion picture began for you in 90-something. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That was so profound that it was like, whoa. And I knew we had something. So it was like, yo, hey, let's put this doc, let's put a documentary together. And then the second thing was when we went to interview Pat Porter. That was like, her interview was something we've never seen before. Like, it was beyond compelling. In my career, I, and I always say, you know, sparked from her, yeah. that interview. You know what I'm saying? So, that was so profound as well. And, um, it just started, it was just love. We, Me and AZ and my man King Carton, all three of us stayed together. We either stayed at my house, we stayed at King Carton house. And we was all locked in spiritually. There's another thing. AZ is into God, hard body. I was into God. King Carlton was into God. We would film and Bible studies. Film and Bible studies. And be locked in. And we would just go around to every place that they ever touched with their money, car dealers, whatever. And just start filming. Just start filming the car dealerships. The, the rim place. You know what I'm saying? 
So, so when y'all went back to that dealership 30 years later, was y'all surprised that, that that white man was still there? No, yeah, we were surprised. And he knew who A was. And we was there for hours. Yeah. For hours, and they was just talking. Footage that I never used, where they was just talking. So that was, like, profound. And, you know, he was, like, saying, these are some of the first young boys. You know what it is for them to come in a car dealership with 30, 40, 50,000? And he's like, you know, we used to have to finagle how we was going to... You know, back then, you didn't even have to too much finagle. They just give them the money. Give them a girl name from McDonald's or something, right. you know, as they would say. Or whatever. So, you know, this was, like, so much fun. So much fun. Like, with me, A, and the kid King Kong. And at that time, K. Slade was just getting started. So K. Slade would be in this tiny little apartment he had in his room. And we would go to K. Slade house. You know, AZ would do drops. You know, we, I would interview K. Slade. You know, we, it was just took on a life of his own and it was fun. You know what I'm saying? And um, at the end of it, after we finished, and at the time I was in college, I went back to college. I took the student loan money to finish the game over. Okay. That's, that's, you know, I was, I, every, every semester I was taking seven grand, eight grand just to finish the, 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 the documentary. And um, at the end of it, right at the end when we had the final master, AZ gave it to somebody to watch. And whoever they was dealing with took it and bootlegged it on VHS. And it got bootlegged. And I joined just... You know, it was like, damn. It was like, man. You know what I'm saying? So once that happened, you know, now the game over took a life of its own without us. It just became the game over, but nobody really knew we did it. You know what I'm saying? It was just a film that was out in the urban market. And, um, you know, that's how it just blew up. So it's something about the story that people seem to do deceitful stuff little slick shit with it, like, because you just got to, you experienced the leak. You, you experienced several leaks in terms of this same story, right? Yeah, you can't, AZ, Alcorn, and Rich Porter is such, it's, they like Malcolm and Martin. This is true for the matter. AZ, Alcorn, and Rich Porter is like Malcolm and Martin. As far as urban tales, as far as black people and culture, that's how strong they are. You got to remember, before Gangsters was wearing shoes and suits. AZ Alpo, Rich Porter, LA, Doo-Wop, John John, and all those group, LA, that group of young kids at that time, they now changed that whole dynamics of you wearing sneakers, what we know today as sneakers, as Nikes, Dunks, before Jordan. You understand what I'm saying? Like we know as sneakers. They was the first one to wear, you know, think about it. Rich Porter and those guys. They wore a regular white tee out shirt, what we call a wife beater to this day. We still rocking. We still rocking. Nigga have a Rolex on now with a million dollar chain and a wife beater. Because that's what they wore. Out the house. And no one never saw that until them. What that wife beater was, what that white tee was. You know, baking soda. They changed the dynamics of baking soda. Baking soda sales changed because of this group of guys. The way you're driving a car, rims. So our whole culture exists around these seven characters from, like I said, John John, Duwap, uh, uh, AZ, Alpo, LA, and Rich. Our culture of black society exists around these guys right here. So it's something that's just a magnet about them. And just so happened, Alpo was the most probably dynamic of all of them because all of them still moved like gangsters and hustlers, quiet. Still tried to move quiet. Alpo approach was a little bit different than theirs. He was a little, you know, you know, Alpo used to tell me he would leave Rich at 8 o'clock at night. Rich would go home, go to sleep, come back out at 8 o'clock in the morning. Poe was in the same on the same car, sitting on the same car with his same group of people. And Rich would be like, nigga, why don't you go home? But that wasn't who Poe was. You know what I'm saying? So it's just those characters, man. Those characters is we're never, we, what else do we know before them? We don't know nothing else, our era before them. And before them was the Nicky Barnes, the Guy Fishers, the, you know, the Big Apple Jacks and people like that. But... We don't know nothing before them, so that's our platform to do what we're doing.